a lead-in for talking about Christ, he's going to jump all over that. And we can do the very same thing here. When you're, when you're walking about, um, I'm, I'm looking at Brother Joey back there. Brother Joey has an awesome opportunity because um, people come to him. And they're usually coming to him expecting for him to solve a problem. tear the car up right so then um so then they come to him and he looks for opportunities to talk about christ and when i've walked into their office they've done certain things to create conversation about christ it it, you know when you go in there that they go to church there's no questions about that you know how they act too uh, that they go to church and that God is very much a part of their life. And so that's all we have to do as we go about. But I love the fact that we have hope. This thing can blow apart all around me, and that doesn't bother me. Why? We were actually told it was going to. <laughs> were we not? Things were going to get worse. That's what the Bible said. And so let's not act surprised about it. But let's use that as an opportunity to, um, to tell other, others about Christ. There's no better opportunity to witness than today. People are looking for truth. Yes, even the people that are so frustrated and everybody is on edge right now, those people. Because sometimes we see these folks that are on edge and we don't want to get near them because, man, this thing, that's a time bomb waiting to, bl- waiting to blow. You know, you see them in the stores. I mean, they're about this close to going postal, you know. And, and, and those that work in restaurants and stores, they know this. And everybody's running around, you know, doing this. And uh, what an opportunity. So, you know, thank God uh, you can just open up a conversation. Thank God that I don't have to worry about that. What are you talking about? You know, woo Well, because God took care of that for me. And just go right into it. Amen. Well, that was a separate sermon and that I didn't mean to start. Um, but, Happy New Year. I'm excited about this year. Why am I excited about this year? Because I have so much, we have so much in God's Word to share this year for Sunday school uh, that I'm, I'm super excited. I'd love to be able to blurt it all out at the same time, but that is not possible. I'm not that capable. But we're just going to continue on where we were at. And if you'll remember before all the holidays and everything, we were finishing up a lesson on what subject? Somebody yell it out. Sin. How, sin. How we deal with sin. Now, we talked about, we talked about how sin is defined in Scripture. Because if we're going to talk about sin, we need to know what sin is. We talked about what sin is, and we also talked a little bit about what sin ain't, to put it in good English. Uh, Sin, according to God's Word, is breaking God's law, number one. Number two, we talked about sin is any kind of unrighteousness. Any unrighteousness, the Bible says, is sin. And then, that third one, which kind of stung a little bit, was we talked about sin, and the Bible says that anything that is done not of faith is sin. So if we, if we do something, we, we're not doing it in faith, it's sin. And we talked about what that meant. Now that got a little interesting as we were going through that and we were talking about it, but the Scripture is very clear, it's not confusing. You just have to take the time to chew on it a little bit and try to understand it. And... On the things, and remember this, anything that is not breaking God's law, anything that is not unrighteousness, those things are clearly defined in Scripture. On the other things, then you depend on whether or not your faith is where it needs to be for that. Okay? When it comes to... um, Do I stand when I pray? Or do I bow my head and close my eyes when I pray or not? 
There's some folks that would say, oh no, if you're not closing your eyes, you're not communicating with God. There's some that would say that. Now, is that a bad thing? No. Is it unrighteousness? No. <laughs> Does it break any law of God? No. It's just one of those items that that person believes that you must bow your head and close your eyes. Um, I find it off, I would find it very difficult when the Bible says pray without ceasing that you could do that all the time, obey scripture and always have your eyes closed when you're praying, but that's just something that I've seen in Scripture. Maybe that person hasn't seen that yet. So we don't beat that person up over that, and we don't. the Bible says we don't get into disputations with them over things like that, but we just gently, we gent, we just gently go along in, in Christian love, and, uh, and when we're around that individual that feels that way, I'll bow my head and close. It's not wrong for me to bow my head and close my eyes as long as I'm not driving. I'll bow my head and close my eyes when that person is, it, when we're praying. Why? Because I don't want to offend another brother. The Bible talks about a weaker brother. Now one thing I need to f clean up a little bit on that one is there's some that will claim the weaker brother's status in order to get their way. That'll preach. But I can, I, can, I can say with all certainty, being a weaker brother is not a good thing. That's not something to be elevated in Scripture. In fact, Paul, he, he, he gets after one or two of those churches, doesn't he? When he's writing those letters, and he says, listen, you guys should be eating steak right about now. But you're still sipping milk. And that's not a good thing. That's not a good, that's not something to be praised. So be careful if, 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 you, if you, you're thinking, oh, I'll just claim weaker brother status and I'll just beat somebody over the head with that. And they got to do what, according to the Bible, they got to do in order not to offend me. They just got to do what I want. That's not a good thing. And you know, you know when somebody doesn't have the right spirit if they are doing that. They're like, bless God, you know, and they're putting their foot down, then they're way past the weaker brother status. They've entered into a whole different category, okay? And we won't get into all that. But weaker brother is not where we want to stay. For those of us that are newer in Christ and we're growing or maybe there's some of us that have accepted Christ uh, many years ago, but we never had that opportunity to grow in grace. And, and so the Bible says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So some of us haven't had that opportunity. So as you're coming along in that, you want to work yourself out of that weaker brother status. And you want to grow. You want to be more like Christ. How do we do that? How do you achieve that you know, and, and, and I have to be very careful because I want to say in my human flesh, I want to say achieve that level. But there's no levels, okay? Everybody's different. And, and God doesn't talk about levels in Christ. So how do you get that way? The more you learn and know and get to know God, Everything else will line up behind that. All these questions that you have, the more you get to know Him, and Brother Mark referred to, how do you get to know Him? Well, the more you put, you, we get into this, this book here, the Word of God, the more it will get into us. And when it gets into us, change happens. It's inevitable. That is, that's the simple answer. Uh, you say, well, there's no self-help thing. No, there's a lot of good books out there. There's a lot of good programs out there. There's a lot of studies out there. But nothing replaces the Word of God, period. The Word of God changes us. Why? It is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It goes in and, and it gets into the innermost parts of who we are. And it will sort it out. 
and point out the defects. That's what the Word of God does. Why? Because it's alive. You say, Brother Dan, that's weird talk. Well, I'm just going off what the Word of God says. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word what? So if the Word was God, and God is the Word, then what we're holding here is real. It's real. It's quick. It changes lives. The preaching of the Word is what, is, is what convicts. Not oratory, not words of human flesh, but the Word of God is what changes. That's why when you're witnessing to somebody as much as you can, get them to read the Word, quote the Word. The Word does the job, not us. Amen? All right, how do we get off on that? Hallelujah. So, the reasons we struggle with sin, and that's where we're at next, so we'll continue on. In today's society... No one or very few want to take or accept responsibility for their actions. Everyone wants to blame something or someone else. Nothing new under the sun. Right out of the chute, first thing Adam did, that woman, she, he threw Eve right under the bus. Whoom, under the bus she goes. He blamed her. I don't know what you were thinking, God, but that woman you gave me, she's bad news. And yet, it's very interesting in Romans 5, 12, the Bible says, For as by one man sin entered into the world. It didn't say by one woman. It said by one man. He knew what he was doing when he disobeyed. She was deceived. Ladies, I thought I'd hear some help there, but <laughs> you left me hanging on that one. He knew what he was doing when he got into it. So anyway, we like to blame other things. But this attitude has also moved into the pew at church. If we're going to deal with sin biblically, we have to understand and accept certain things. Number one, we sin because we still have this flesh. Amen. Amen. We still have this flesh and choice. God gave each individual something. And that was, we say it in, in Spanish, it has its own name. Uh, but but in, in, in English, I think the word is will. You have the will. You have a choice. You can, you can be here if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You say, well, Brother Dan, God will kill me if I... No, that's not the God I serve. He would love for you to, and He wants you to do it out of heart of love, but He ain't going to make you do anything. He didn't make you get saved. He presented it to you. He provided everything that you needed to, to become part of the family of God, and He left that up to you. He gave you that. The God of the universe said, I don't want to force them to love me. I want the, them to love me out of a heart of love. That's, that's why the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. And the ones that don't, that's their choice. That's their choice. So we sin because we have our flesh and choice. It's that plain and simple. We were given that from God. I'll take you to Romans chapter 6. I'll not read the entire chapter, but Romans chapter 6 talks about, talks about this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He's dealing with this issue that we will be tempted of our flesh to sin. And then he says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized or submerged or uh, 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 infused with, into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? When we, when, we, when we do the physical baptism here, we are identifying ourselves with what Christ went through. And it's a symbolic thing that he asks of us to do 
so that we identify with Him, but that literally takes place when we are saved. We are submerged in Christ. We identify with His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. There's a new life that comes about for the believer. Behold, if any man is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he is a what? A new creature. All things passed away. From now on, everything is new. It's new. It's like a brand new year. You start out. Uh, there's a term in Spanish that I love. It says, borrón y cuenta nueva. That means erased in a brand new account. It doesn't really translate real cool, but it sounds cool in Spanish. But in, in, in English, it means it's erased, and you're starting off with a brand new account. And I love that expression. That's what happens at salvation. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is what? that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Many of us are dwelling in this one area that the Scripture says we're past that. Behold, if any man is in Christ, we say it, he's a new creature, amen, but we don't live like we believe it. If you're a new creature, you're a new creature. You're not subject to or condemned to sin anymore. You don't have to. It's not something we have to do. So we sin because we still have that flesh and choice. Okay. Second, we sin because our flesh is drawn to sin even after we're saved. Getting saved doesn't mean that we're exempt from the temptations of sin. When Christ took on the form of flesh, and He came to this earth, we see that exemplified in His life on this earth. He was led by the Spirit into the desert, and then when He was in the desert, He went so many days without eating, and then Satan shows up at one of His weakest moments to do what? To tempt Him to do what? To sin. Now, Christ was tempted also like we would. Christians still experience that temptation. Now, you know what the really cool thing is? And you can, I'm dating myself when I use the word cool. I get that. But I think it's super neat. When you go to 1 John and you see that, um, you see what, uh, let's do that. Let's go to, what is it, 1 John chapter 2? Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. And let's look at this real quick so I can get it right. First John chapter 2. Where it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then it says, For all that is in the world. And it talks about three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, these three areas are areas that you and I are going to be tempted in. Anything that comes across your path as a temptation can, can fall under one of these three categories. Either the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes or the pride of life? Anything. Think about it. Anything that you would be tempted with, follows, did you know that's the exact same three things that Satan used to tempt Christ? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Did you know that's the same three things that Satan used in the Garden of Eden to tempt Eve? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Remember, she saw that the tree was, it looked good to eat, and, 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 and it was desired as to make one wise. There's pride there, 
okay? All those three things. Did you know that those are the exact same three areas that you're going to be tempted in? Any one of those things? So you know where you're going to be hit with. You know what areas you're going to be tempted in. Nothing is new. He's used the same tactic in the Garden of Eden as He did with Christ when He showed up on earth and took on the form of flesh as He uses today. So you don't have to be surprised when we're tempted in these areas. And that's, and that's where... Um, that's the third point here as far as the reasons we struggle with sin. Number one... We have flesh and choice. Number two, our flesh is drawn even after we get saved. There's the flesh. Uh, what, what's that verse say in, um, uh, let's see here. I thought I put it down in here. Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at Galatians 5 here. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and what? The two don't mix. The two don't mix. You're either doing one or the other. Why? You're in Christ. You're a new creature. You have the Holy Spirit of God. What? Know ye not that your temple is the, is, 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 your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? that you have of God and you're not your own. So that's who you are now in Christ. You're not the old guy running around trying to be a new guy. Did you get that? If we believe what the Bible says, we're the new guy that still struggles with something and that's that flesh that we still live in until we get a new body. Amen? This is a defining thing in a Christian's life. This, this defines whether or not you are going to have victory in your life over sin. Satan has done a, a number on, on the believer in, in, in that he's done this. He has caused us to focus so much on sin, that's, that, that's all we're thinking about. Nobody thinks about the fact that God took care of that on the cross. We're not dwelling on that. In fact, we, we oh, poor us. No, I don't live there anymore. I am dead to that. That's not who I am. That's, sin does not define me anymore. And Satan does a number on us when he gets us to dwell on that. You say, Brother Dan, you're getting a little, little tense about this. Well, I am a little passionate about it because I'm tired of seeing Bible-believing Christians live there when they could live here. And it's not Satan's fault. We blame a lot on the devil. And it ain't his fault. Because we have been given every information that we need. God has provided everything that we need in order to live here. He takes and places himself in us. He gives us the power to do it. So he says in Galatians... Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. For the, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. That is the war that goes on within a believer. And it's that flesh and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to, the, to another. So that you cannot do the things that you, that you would. So they war at each other. They war at each other. But if ye be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You're not under the law. It's funny how um, the, the writer tucks that in there. If you're led by the Spirit, the law is not necessary. Because the Spirit is very well and capable of handling itself and guiding you in the right way without any rules. 
Hello. Amen? We have the ultimate standard that has chosen to set up shop in us. And remember, remember the exchange between Christ and the Pharisees? They were saying, oh, but we've, man, we, we've kept the law. Ever. And he says, yeah, this is, your, this, is, this is the law. This is my standard. You have within you that standard. Amen? Are, are you with me? Okay, are we breathing? Okay, good. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, they're manifest or they're demonstrated, which are these. This is how they're demonstrated. And then he gives us a list. Whenever you see things like he lists in verse 19 and 20 and 21, when you see those things, you can know that that individual is walking in the flesh. If he's saved, if that individual is saved, they're walking in the flesh if you see evidence of that in their life. Okay? But on the other hand, when you see evidence in an individual's life, like is listed in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, not fruits, fruit evidence of, okay, I used to think, when I was younger, I used to think, fruits, man, i got to try hard. I, man, i gotta, I got to try to love everybody. So that week, I would try to love everybody. I was loving everybody. And I was loving everybody, but I was as impatient to deal with as, the, as, 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 as anyone. And, and I would, all my focus was on love, 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 and everything else went to pot. And I'm like, man, i gotta work on, I got to work on patience this next week. And so I would be patient that week, and love just went out the window. You know, I was focusing on all these individual things when I didn't understand what the Bible was saying here. The fruit or the evidence of the Spirit in my life is all that, together, combined. Amen? I don't have to work on those things if I allow myself to be led by the Spirit. If I walk in the Spirit I will automatically show that in my life. It'll be evidenced in my life. Wow, this took a turn. Hallelujah. Against such, there is no law. So we sin as a result of temptation in those areas. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. How do we resolve all this? Just walk in the Spirit. Just walk in the Spirit. You say, well, Brother Dan, you know, that's easy to say. Yeah, it is. And it's a lot more difficult to do. But walking in the Spirit basically is just saying, you give Christ, you give God number one spot in your life in everything. In everything. Even when I get up, yeah. Even when you get up. Even the route I take to work, yeah. God knows if there's a wreck waiting for you on 26. And if you can go another route, you might want to consult him about that before you take off that morning and say, Lord, Holy Spirit of God, where should, which route should I take today? Guide me as to what, and avoid some of that mess. It's, it's very, very, very simple and it's super easy and I love it. Walk in the Spirit. Amen? Now, how does God deal with sin? I've got few more minutes. This is a no-brainer. We all know this, but God hates sin. He hates sin. He can't stomach sin. Why? Sin is what separated us from God initially. And sin is what separates all unbelievers from God. God hates sin. He hates sin. That's how he deals with sin. He hates it. But he loves us. He loves us. And so if we continue to live in sin, you say a person can do that? Yes. 
And it's very difficult sometimes for us because we see an individual and that claims to be saved and we think, how in the world can they get by with that and still do that? Well, we know this, Hebrews chapter 5, and we've talked to, or 12, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12 and verse 5, real quick. <clears throat> he says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. And he says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, we're talking about believers. God doesn't punish believers. He chastens them. Okay? If he punishes us, what is the punishment for sin? Death and hell. Eternal separation from God. So God doesn't punish a believer. God chastens. Look at the wording that he uses here in your Bible. He says, Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord when thou art what of him? He'll rebuke us. He will rebuke us. For whom the Lord loveth, what does he do to? He chasteneth. And then sometimes he'll scourge. The term is scourge, every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as a son. So if you're being chastened from God, that's a good sign. It's not a bad thing necessarily. It's bad that you're in the position that you're in to be chastened and to be rebuked and to be scourged of God. But it's also a good thing because that says what? I'm a son. Whew, thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing that to my attention. Thank you for straightening me out on that. Wow, that's actually encouraging to get a whooping from God. Okay? Now, we don't like it. The Bible says, um, despise not thou, because it's not fun. But aren't we stubborn, though, at times? And there are times in a believer's life when we will go down a path that we know that is not right and will insist on going down that path, and that's when God steps in. Now, here's where we have to be careful as fellow believers. God is super long-suffering and patient, or else He'd have snuffed me out a long time ago. And so the same patience that he uses with me, he also extends to other people. And when we feel somebody ought to get a lightning bolt from heaven, God may think he's not ready yet for that. There's other ways I can work on it. And in fact, God may already be doing a work in that individual's life that you know nothing about. Because punishment or chastisement, not punishment, chastisement and scourging and rebuking comes in all shapes and forms, does it not? And you and I both know that whenever God is working in our life, when it has to do with something that we insist on doing and we shouldn't, we know when God's working in our life. That is the first thing that pops in our brain whenever we're being chastened by the Lord. Amen? So, how does God deal with sin? He hates sin. He can't stand sin. Wow. Next Sunday, we'll have time to finish up how God expects us to deal with sin. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty extensive subject, isn't it? But you know what? It's kind of nice to get it all out in the open, isn't it? And to air it all out. And to go ahead and deal with it, find out where we stand, find out what the scripture says about it, because then we can move on. We can move on with this thing. We all deal with it. Some of us are a little more vocal about it than others, but we all deal with it. Amen. Father, thank you so much for providing a way for us to live according to how you would have us to live. 
please, Lord, I pray that you would allow us not to fall into the trap of Satan and dwell on sin. You have freed us from that. And I pray that we would live as you have chosen above that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much. We'll see you in just a few.